Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now, I wasn't supposed to be filming today, but your comments and inputs under my uh, latest video are so good and interesting and well thought out that you've inspired me to make another video. Um, and it's actually a topic which comes up under a lot of videos, and I have to say, I think I'm partly to blame for this. Right, so, let's talk about handguards on swords and hand protection. So, I think people like me and the other YouTubers out there, you know, um, Raffaella, Metatron, um, Shad, Lloyd, um, uh, Scal, all the various people out there have accidentally trained you guys watching our channels to look down on swords that don't have hand protection, okay? And yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Sabre fan. Yeah, I'll just grab a random, random old sword that I've got sticking around here. So here's a, here's a 1912 pattern uh, World War I officer sword with a massive hand guard on it. Yes, hand protection's lovely within certain contexts, but for most of history, most swords haven't had very much hand protection. Now, obviously I've been doing, starting to do some videos about Chinese swords and, um, Bizarrely, one of the criticisms that comes up, particularly yesterday when I uh, reviewed this um, Chu two-handed sword, the Roaring Dragon from L.K. Chen, and some people have said, it's lovely, lovely sword, but I'd like more hand protection. And the simple fact is, we're studying historical swords, and at this historical period, barely any swords, really, had much hand protection. Uh, you know, if you're looking at Roman swords, if you're looking at the Gladius or the Spartha, um, then they don't really have much hand protection either. If, if you're looking at earlier Bronze Age swords, they don't really have much hand protection. There is a bizarre exception in the um, Falcata and the so certain forms of Copius, which do have a sort of knuckle guard or certainly a more encased kind of front to them. And they kind of stand out from the rest. They're kind of unusual, but you look at the Egyptian Kopesh, that doesn't really have much hand protection. So fundamentally, most swords um, until later in history didn't really have much hand protection. And even if we go to the, uh, the Middle Ages in Europe, you don't have much hand protection on a Viking era sword. You don't really start to get longer um, cross guards on swords until around the time of the Norman Conquest in Britain. So around the year 1000 AD. Yeah, you do get some longer hilts in, a little bit earlier in the in the sort of um, earlier in the tenth century, but they're not they're not so common. And there are certain forms of um, uh, sword found in the Islamic world and in India, which do indeed have a bit more hand protection to them. But those aside, they're kind of outliers. Most swords didn't have hand protection. Now. We've always focused in the past on, oh, why don't certain swords need hand protection? And the general answer that everyone is now trained to go is, ah, shields, because if you're using a sword uh, with a shield, you don't actually need a huge amount of uh, hand protection on it, because when you attack, the line to your sword arm and sword hand is usually covered by the shield. So predominantly, people statistically predominantly attack right-handed people, attack from the right-hand side. If someone's attacking from this side, and I just extend my weapon out by itself, my hand and my arm is vulnerable. It doesn't matter whether I'm, I recognize that and I'm trained. Yes, you can, there are ways that if you know that's vulnerable, you, you keep your hand back, you keep your uh, sword in positions. If we look at long sword fencing and messer fencing, we keep it back in positions that leave it not vulnerable for as long as possible. And we only move it out when we're doing defensive actions or offensive actions, fine. But if you've got a shield, then as you extend the arm, uh, you generally cover that line to the arm and hand with the shield as well. You might have to cover your head, but you might cover your head and your um, sword hand and sword arm at the same time. But that's not what I want to say in this video, but I have to say it because most people now know that most swords used that have minimal amount of hand protection um, were used historically with shields, yes, but not always. Many weren't. Um, examples being, well, indeed, the, um, for example, the, uh, the Jan, uh, Jian, sorry, uh, was used um, by itself. The two-handed version, obviously, the Jian was used by, by itself without a shield. We could go to the various forms of Da, which come from uh, Burma and Thailand and Vietnam, places like that, the Krabi, variations of it. We can even go to the uh, forms of 
Japanese and um, uh, Korean and other Chinese swords that don't have much hand protection. No one ever criticizes, well, that's not <laughs> completely true because I have done and I think other people have done, but no one goes that says that the katana is a bad sword because it doesn't have a lot of hand protection, do they? Okay, still, still a good sword. Um, you just modify your system of swordsmanship for the fact that your hands are vulnerable and that's the same with the uh, two-handed long uh, Jien as well. Um, and indeed if we look at other periods of sword uh, we could go to the um, Arabic or Persian um, Shamshir okay, um, or the Kilich as well um, and indeed even into the Napoleonic era despite the fact we do have availability of basket hilts and very half basket hilts and shell guards and this kind of stuff a lot of swords in that era also didn't really have an awful lot of hand protection. Yeah, okay, I've got a knuckle bow. But the point I want to make is that, yes, shields are important in this equation, but lots of these swords were used by themselves and still didn't have very much hand protection. But number one, if everybody has equally vulnerable hands, then it kind of cancels out. It's kind of irrelevant because remember, yes, your hands and arms are vulnerable and they are the easiest thing to hit, and they are certainly inspiring in Hema and other martial arts. They're the thing that are most likely to get hit and injured. Um, but additionally, the whole rest of your body is theoretically uncovered as well. Um, and very often when you're in a fight where you pull a sword out, you're trying to kill the opponent as quickly as possible. So you're not necessarily thinking about sniping their hands and arms. You're thinking about stabbing them through the chest or hitting them in the head. Um, or lopping their entire arm off, you know, in which case a bit of hand protection isn't really going to make very much difference. But the second and main point that I want to make is people don't level the criticism. We've become so fixated on swords, they don't level this criticism at all the other weapons on the battlefield which don't have any hand protection whatsoever. So people never go, ah, oh, well, you know, Spears aren't really good weapons because they don't have much hand protection. <laughs> no. And some people might go, oh yeah, but they have hand protection by virtue of their length. That might be true against a sword. However, if you have sparred spear against sword, which I can assure you I have done a lot of, the bit that the spearman, if the spearman's going to get hit, where do they get hit? They get hit on the hand and arm, usually the lead arm, whichever way around you've got it. So your hand and arm is vulnerable to a swordsman, but more importantly, most of your opponents aren't going to have swords anyway, they're going to have other spears. And indeed, if you're fighting someone with a spear, usually you're going for their head and body, but very often you hit them in the arm and the hand. And in fact, there were forms of medieval, particularly in the 15th century, um, well, actually particularly in the 15th century, um, less so later, less so earlier, you do sometimes get disc guards on certain forms of pole arm. Pole axes, um, um, old space, um, these types of, you know, types of glaive as well. Some, some of them have a disc guard on. So they did think about hand protection, but uh, and you, some of you might go, lots of these guys were wearing gauntlets. Yes, some of them were, but some of them weren't. Lots of people using spears throughout history haven't had any hand protection whatsoever and were using their pole arms by themselves. You know, whether they're using pikes or halberds or bills or glaives or whatever, they were using their weapon by themselves without a shield without hand protection, probably not even gloves according to the art most of the time. So people don't level the criticism there. They don't level the criticism at war hammers or at axes. Uh, so these things have less hand protection than the uh, swords that where people do criticize, you know? So people go, ah, oh, well, I don't really like this type of GN because it doesn't have much hand protection. But neither does a glaive, neither does a spear, neither does an ax, neither does a war hammer. So, as always, this is context, big picture. Try and think big picture, okay? So what is this? This is, yes, it's a two-handed sword. Does it have less hand protection than the Zweihander behind me? Yeah, it has less hand protection than the Zweihander behind me, but it still has the same or even slightly more hand protection than a spear or a glaive or a bill or whatever, okay? So it's got, it's got a bit of hand protection, but even if it had none, well, it's still the same as a pole arm, isn't it? It's no different to a, it's just a short pole arm. Well, it's not that short, but for a pole arm length, it's relatively short. So it is still equivalent. It's not lesser. It's just equivalent to most of the other weapons on the battlefield. We've become too fixated on swords. And the disadvantage of having a huge amount of hand protection, I've talked about this with basket hilts before. And one of the reasons that I'm not that keen on basket hilts 
is you add a lot of weight to a weapon when you add a hilt. So, you know, we looked at the weights of these uh, Chinese swords and a lot of the people reviewing these, like Scal and others, are going, wow, they're super light, super light. And it's because they're used to holding medieval swords. And quite fundamentally, medieval swords tend to be heavier than these particular types of uh, Chinese sword because they've got more hilt furniture. If you look at the bare blade weight, the bare blades aren't always really lighter or not much lighter than their medieval equivalents. Where the extra weight comes in is we don't have a big disc pommel or you know fishtail or scent stopper pommel. We don't have a big cross guard. We certainly certainly don't have big side rings or pointy lugs or stuff like this. So yes, they're fairly slender blades, true, uh, but they're not super, super light. Um, so that's where the big uh, weight difference comes in. So context as always, uh, obviously my favorite word, Loads of swords throughout history haven't had hand protection um, because they presumably didn't deem it necessary or they didn't think that the disadvantages were necessarily would outweigh the advantages. In war, you're not necessarily standing there sniping each other's hands. You're quickly stabbing someone through the body or you know, hitting them in the head uh, from behind. Remember, melee fighting, skirmish fighting, battlefield fighting is different to a duel. Lastly, I would say um, that... And some of you might know that, not know this, um, but in the period that these jian were being used in China, they did indeed practice swordsmanship, both with shields and certain types of hook shield and all sorts of other uh, contraptions, and also just with the sword itself. And we all know that certain sword forms have survived to the modern world. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that they do have sparring versions of jian um, and that survive and in private collections and in museums. And what's interesting is they have added hand protection on them. Now, why did they have added hand protection on their practice version, but not on their battlefield version? Well, that's an interesting, so you feel free to comment below and give your ideas of why that might be the case. Personally, I would think that there's a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is just the same as when we get into dueling rather than battlefield weapons. So most medieval people thought a cross guard was enough. Most Vikings and Anglo-Saxons thought that that was enough hand protection for their sword. When we get into rapiers and small swords uh, and basket hilted broadswords, people obviously thought at that point, well, well, I want a lot more hand protection. The context of the use of the sword has changed. It has moved not just from being a battlefield weapon that you wear predominantly your side and you pull out at the moment you need it and hit someone in the head and that's the end of the use of that weapon. That's the most that you use it or you run, you see your buddies just about get killed and you run over and you stab a person and finish them off. That's how the sword is predominantly being used. When we get into a later dueling culture period, suddenly people are facing off against each other. They're starting with their swords out of their uh, scabbards and they're probably holding the weapons in front of them a little bit more. We certainly see this in the 16th century compared to the 15th century sources. We see that the sword positions start moving uh, from instead of these sort of withdrawn positions that we see in longsword and messer treatises, we start to see in the dusak and then the side sword and the rapier, we start to see these frontal uh, positions start to be presented more um, with the weapon. Uh, when you're fighting more one-on-one -on -one in more of a kind of dueling context or sporting context. So I think in that scenario, the hands become more vulnerable because you're aiming to hit the other person, wound the other person, incapacitate the other person in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. And you're thinking about that more and you're practicing with practice weapons, with blunt, blunt, practice, blunt practice weapons, where the hands, hand hits are more likely to become a thing and a thing that you try and prevent. Um, and so that you add hand protection in that scenario. And it's interesting that if we go back 2000 years in China, they ended up coming to a similar conclusion in a way, to uh, sort of 16th century Europe, in that when you have a weapon that is specialised to essentially duelling, it might be a blunt uh, practice one, you need some hand protection on there. But the battlefield weapon, and we see this still in the 16th century, you can st still see simple, I don't have an arming sword with me, but you still see simple cross-hilted swords um, being used in the 16th century. You still see simple hilts being used in the 16th century in battlefield use. Uh, despite the fact that complex hilts, uh, like on rapiers, were being used as well. Um, so some people specifically chose the simpler hilt 
maybe because it's easier to wear, it's easier to access. If you maybe got gauntleted or armoured body or hands, um, then it's easier to get out. It gets in the way less when you're, that's a secondary weapon and you're operating a, um, operating a main weapon such as a halberd, uh, then a simple cross hilt's less likely to get tangled up with your main weapon than a, than a swept hilt or a basket hilt might do. So it's a very complex topic, but the headline that I want to conclude on is don't criticise swords that are from a historical period and that they came to those conclusions of design for the full range of context that we don't necessarily fully understand yet now, okay? You can't really criticize a katana for only having a, a simple round suba, or the uh, gien for having almost no cross guard, or the viking sword for having such a short guard, uh, because clearly that's what worked in the time, that's what people used, okay? If we're studying historical martial arts, whether it's from China or Europe or Africa or anywhere else, just accept what they used and use it, number one. Secondly, um, don't criticise the sword for having a, a small handguard when that might simply be deemed adequate, okay? Um, you don't necessarily need a com complex handguard and there are some advantages to only having a simple handguard. And finally, the main point I want you to take away from this video is it's really silly criticising a sword for not having enough hand protection when the main battlefield weapons like spears and glaives and bills and, pole and axes and pole axes and stuff like this didn't have any hand protection at all, okay? So remember the context, don't just compare this to other swords, compare it to all weapons of the time and think about realistically how these weapons were used on the battlefield. Don't think about sparring or dueling or this kind of thing because this isn't how weapons were predominantly used in actual warfare. Thanks for watching, um, I hope you've enjoyed this video, give us a like and a subscribe and I'll see you really soon for another video on Scholar Gladiatory channel. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon, please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!